While we're on the topic of lighting, what is your, say your go-to, your typical lighting setup that you're doing? Well, lighting is a mystery, mm -hmm. okay? So anyone who says, hey, I understand lighting from day one, well, they're lying to you, okay? It's a mystery, and what makes it more of a mystery is all the options that we have, from mm -hmm. modifiers, from from a box. Beauty dishes, like Beauty you dishes, <laughs> octoboxes, umbrellas, yep. you know, uh, ring lights, all these things, okay? so. What happens is, is when we look at, say, someone's lighting, or so I, let's say I tell you, this is what my lighting is, or you see behind the scenes video, which I have, mm -hmm. and I have no problem showing what I do. People go, I'm gonna run out and buy the, that set of modifiers, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna get the Joel Grimes look. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> and uh, uh, because here's, here's, here's the most important thing. Lighting is really this simple. Yeah. Right? And, and I have this and I, when I teach lighting, is that um, if, you, if you get this, it doesn't matter what modifier you have, what color the inside of the modifier is from silver to white to, you know, what if you want to put purple. Um, you know, what shape the modifier is. Okay, so there's all these different shapes, square, mm -hmm. round, you know, a star, whatever you want to <laughs> make it. The bigger the source in relationship to the subject, the softer the light. Mm -hmm. So, knowing that, if I want an edgier look, I either back my light source up. Or go with smaller lights. Smaller modifier, mm -hmm. okay? So if I have a edge light, which I, I do, I mm -hmm. can do that with a square box, a strip light, a round beauty dish, mm -hmm. or octo, whatever. It's the bigger the source in relationship to the subject, the softer the light. Yeah. So I typically go with, for my edge lights, I go with a large, it's now Westcott, but it's mm -hmm. a big, you know, it's a pretty good size. I mm -hmm. think they have a extra large, large, medium, small, mm -hmm. okay? so. My go-to now typically is a large box as my edge lights and a small, either a beauty dish or a, um, a octo mm -hmm. as my overhead. Okay, okay? so yep. the overhead light, mm -hmm. okay? So um, the sharpness of that edge light, if I want it really, really defined, I have to back my lights up or get a smaller source. Mm -hmm. So I have some smaller boxes mm -hmm. that I put on as my edge lights. I started out with those actually. Mm -hmm. And some of my earlier stuff's a little edgier because I was using smaller modifiers. Yeah. Now, there's a limit to how far you can bring them in because they end up in the shot, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I make a decision on what modifier to use as my edge lights on based on how edgy I want it. Now, here's another thing that's kind of interesting is that um, for the most part, we can always build contrast easily in Photoshop but not take it out. Mm. So I learned that it's better to have a little softer light yeah. in the raw, and then build the contrast later because mm. it's, it's already going to yeah, yeah. it's going to build automatically. Right? Yeah. So for a while there, I kept trying to hold back the contrast. Mm -hmm. Then I realized, well, if I go to a bigger box, then I solve most of that. Yeah, yeah. So really, my two, go to lighting is the the large uh, boxes in the back, and I put grids on them. Mm -hmm. That's a strip box, right? The, the thin no, they're, ones no, they're, the no, they're, they're full size. Okay. You can do strip. Now, strip's going to be a little edgier than a full size. Uh -huh. Now, a strip will light further head to toe. Mm -hmm. Here's another thing. If you have a small box that's two feet away and you get a great light, okay, mm -hmm. well, you, you don't get the feet, right? Mm -hmm. So if you take a medium box and put it five feet away, you're lighting more head to toe. If you put a large box 10 feet away, you've lit the head to toe. And it acts the same way since it's further from the subject. Exactly. So... I have another question to ask myself. Do I want just the head shot or do I want head to toe? Mm -hmm. I also like light to start at the top and kind of taper down. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I over light a subject head to toe in Photoshop, I actually end up darkening the legs and work my way up. Because mm -hmm. that's where a natural eye kind of goes from brighter to darker. Yeah. So these are questions I ask myself is what kind of what's my end result? And that's what I go to the modifiers. So if I put a um, here's my rule of thumb for my overhead light. Mm -hmm. Okay, my overhead light is going to light this portion of the face. Mm. Okay, the edge lights come in, they creep in, they come right along here. Mm -hmm. So a flash meter will never tell you histogram, a schematic that you're working off of, <laughs> or whatever will never tell you where to put that light to get the light right perfectly in the yeah. face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can only do that by moving the lights. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, and you can do that by looking at the back of the monitor. Yeah. So it's really simple as that. So if I tell you to put a large box 4.3 feet at angle whatever, that may work for one person, but it may not work for the next person. Mm -hmm. So that's why lighting is, we've overcomplicated it. Mm -hmm. We go, oh, we have to do this, and we find this formula, and we try to follow it, and then it doesn't work for us. When people get into the mindset that they have to have everything to be able to do what they want to do. And so you get into this kind of like gear acquisition, what is it called, a gas? Gear acquisition syndrome. <laughs> but you get into that phase where you're just like, oh, I can't create this look, or I can't do what I want to do because I don't have this, and I don't have this, and I don't have, and soon enough, you go to a shoot and you look like a crazy person because you're running around with like all these different things, your huge backpack, your light meter. Yes. Yeah. And when you're saying, look, like I love, you just basically said, I could create my look with give me any any light two and any modifier and I'll create my look. Yeah, I, I've done it with two umbrellas Yeah. as my background lights. Yeah. Now that light's going to throw light on the background, so that mm -hmm. be, could be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Also, the reason why I have grids on my boxes is to minimize my flare From in my lens. Light to the camera. Because I'm a I'm a wide angle guy, mm -hmm. so I, and I have zooms, a lot of zooms. So a, a wide angle zoom is going to pick up every flare. Yeah. So that's why I have a grid, not to crowd the light, which it does a little bit, and keep it from the background. Mm -hmm. But really, it's there for the purpose of my lens. Is you know I don't want flare. Yeah. So, but yeah, you give me. In fact, I want to do this. And I keep saying I'm going to do it. And I haven't done it yet. I'm going to take three trash can lids uh -huh. and create a three edge light. And then show the picture, and then show the, the scene, because you can do it. You can bounce light off a trash can lid, paint, yeah. spray paint it white, and boom, you have a modifier. Yeah, a wall's a modifier. In fact, one of the other things that people don't usually consider is that we always have, to some degree, unless you're in a studio with pitch black, uh, with you know, with painted black, you have some kind of bounce you have light. Yeah, and so. Um, that's going to end up softening your image to some degree. So the more bounce, the softer it is. So if yeah. you have a really hit, edgy light, but you bring some bounce around, it's going to soften the whole thing up. Yeah. So that's another thing I do is I put a bounce in. Um, th whether your floor is white or it's black or you're outdoors on a sand beach or on an asphalt is going to change the way the light bounces. Mm -hmm. So here's another thing I do is when I'm outdoors and I have an athlete and they say, you have to shoot it outdoors, mm -hmm. okay? I will go with a smaller set of modifiers because I know I have a lot of ambient light. Mm. So I don't need my large boxes outdoors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My small ones will work. I take the inner baffle out so I have a little more punch mm -hmm. and I can throw light a little bit further with those and that way I can get away with shooting and overpowering the sun. Yeah. So I know that because of what? Experience. Practice, you know? <laughs> Practice. And I don't need the big modifiers outdoors. Plus the wind blows, so the smaller the modifiers, it actually allows you to hold those stupid yeah, things Yeah, you don't down. need to carry 50-pound sandbags everywhere you go. <laughs> but lighting is really simple if you understand those basics. Yeah. But most people don't know where they want to end up. And they see a video and they say, oh, this guy used this. I'm going to buy that. Yeah. I get, I, I answer, it takes me three hours a day to answer emails. Okay. And about 80% of the emails I get are people saying, what size beauty dish do you have? And I say, well, it's 22-inch. They go, well, I found a 20-inch. Do you think that would work? <laughs> it's like, or a 24-inch. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Or, you know, what about silver in, uh, interior boxes or white interior boxes? Or, you know, I got this great deal on this box that's made in Korea, you know. Can I, is it going to be as good as yours? I'm like, you know what? It's this light is light. It may not hold up as long. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. People are so into every, I mean, I get questions exactly what underwear I'm wearing when I'm doing my shoot. I mean, it's that crazy. And it's not that, it's not that. I'm sure that affects your, yeah, it your results though. I don't wear underwear. No. You don't wear <laughs> now I'm in trouble. Well, should we edit that out or keep yeah. it in? <laughs> so, well, like you said, understanding light is something that just takes practice and experience. I was at a wedding once and, uh, sorry, that's where most of my experience is. We do our, I do my fun editorial stuff, but it's only for my own stuff. Um, but we get hired to do weddings. So at a wedding, I was asked to do a portrait and I didn't have a ceiling nearby or a wall nearby to bounce off of. And I didn't have anything, but I had my assistant who was wearing a white shirt. So I'm like, stand next to me. And I just pulled my flash and bounced it right off his shirt. Absolutely. And it looked great. Absolutely. So getting out of that, you know, kind of the whole gear syndrome of, of oh, I got to have this and got to have that. I think is really important for photographers. And you heard it here that Joel, Joel does everything. He'll create any one of his effects with virtually anything. I could give you two flashes with bare strobes and you'd probably go and do just fine with them. So, In fact, my overhead light, which I use now, like I said, beauty dish, I usually put a sock on it, mm -hmm. so it's a little softer, mm -hmm. uh, an Octabox, 
Okay, I got a five footer. Oh, I was gonna tell you, my rule of thumb in my overhead lights is that a, say a two footer, mm -hmm. which is 22 inches, almost two feet, looks best at about two feet. Mm, from the two, foot, two foot beauty dish. Yeah. A five foot octo mm -hmm. looks really good about five feet. <laughs> Just and keep the same size. Seven foot, <laughs> you know, umbrella or a octo looks good about seven feet. That's a good place I to start. I love that rule of thumb. Yeah. That's a great rule of thumb. You know, and then I, I change it up, yeah. you know, or I bounce light. So if I have a beauty dish that's two feet away from my subject, you look at my behind the videos, mm -hmm. most of my beauty dishes are right here. Mm -hmm. It's two feet away. And if it's a little too, you know, if I'm not getting underneath the chin, I just take a little piece of white, anything, mm -hmm. bounce it in. Yeah. It's like like golden. It's beautiful. So I'm going to say, but I've used an umbrella as my overhead. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I did I did a test. I took my, you know, my Octo, shot it, took an umbrella, shot it. Couldn't tell the difference. Yeah. Because all this lighting is right here. Yeah. That overhead light's only going to be lighting right here and throwing light a little bit, you know. The umbrella's going to throw light a little bit more. Yeah. We know that. Yeah. But really on the face, I couldn't tell the difference because the bigger the source in relationship to the subject, the softer the light. Mm -hmm. So that's really the key to it all. If you get that, um, lighting makes more sense. And my encouragement is also, um, you know, if you have one light, shoot with one light. Mm -hmm. A lot can be done with one light. Mm -hmm. You say, well, I can't afford another light. Well, wait until you can. Mm -hmm. Don't go in debt buying equipment that you don't need. <laughs> or that you can't afford. Can't afford, yeah, because <laughs> it'll come. Eventually it'll come. Yeah. And uh, you'll learn that a, a, a 60 inch umbrella, I think a 60 inch, which are about, what, 50 bucks, mm -hmm. is a ma amazing light. It is. Modified. It is. You can do so much with it other than bring it down to the beach where it's going to be a giant sale. And well, <laughs> that, and, and I, so here's, here's another question people ask me. I have these five foot, or no, seven foot octos mm -hmm. from Westcott, and they're pretty pricey. Yeah, Westcott also makes a seven foot umbrella mm -hmm. that you can put a diffusion on. Mm -hmm. So people say, what's the difference between the two? Nothing, except yeah. for your octo box you'll have for ten years or twenty years. Mm -hmm. Your umbrella you'll have for about two years. Yeah, umbrellas they get destroyed. They, they get destroyed really easily. Yeah. So there's the difference. So if you know, hey, I love a seven foot light source, and I know I'm gonna you know use it a lot. Buy an Octobox because you'll it'll, you'll have it for a long time. Well, and if you're going to use it in the studio only and it's going to stay in one place, save the money and get the umbrella. There right? you go. So, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, hearing you talk about lighting, hearing you talk about reminds me of just how good of an educator you are. And you do, aside from shooting, you shoot a ton of right now. What other educational things are you doing? I know you have Lit Up right now. It's a Frame Network yes. show. Yeah. Um, what are you doing on Lit Up exactly? Uh, it is actually 16 weeks of talking about lighting. I like it. So I take I take an image and we talk about the image, the history of it, and then I go and I duplicate not duplicate exactly, but yeah. I go in and I say, okay, here's my three edge light with small modifiers. Here's my three edge light with larger modifiers. Here's my uh, I shoot a lot against a white wall mm -hmm. because white will bounce back, mm -hmm. and it actually becomes a modifier too. So you have one light source against a white wall, and then you get the you get the bounce back, bounce. and you get some really cool stuff. So I go through all that with lit up, um, and those are all free. They are right, yeah, they're free right now. That's I think crazy. what they're going to do eventually. I don't know the whole history of what they're doing, but uh -huh. they're great people, by the way. Yeah, um, they have really good quality stuff. Yeah, so. and um, uh, they are free right now. Mm -hmm. um, I have on my blog. I have my own videos I sell, and you know I've had them for you know I keep updating them, but I only have six videos, mm -hmm. and I go everything from the from HDR backgrounds mm -hmm. how I do that to lighting to I have one on marketing. Uh, which people go, well, I don't need that one. I'm like, yeah, actually, that's the one you need the most. <laughs> Seriously. And um, uh, I have one on retouching skin and all stuff. Um, then I, um, Kelby Training, I have a couple. Uh -huh. couple oh, I uh, didn't know you had yeah, Kelby Training. Yeah. Yeah, that's and great. then I speak at the Photoshop world, and I, I have about 40 events a year that I go around speaking at. I have my own workshops at um, my Pasadena studio. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this year, I've only been able to do three. So mm -hmm. I have the third one's going to be in August. Uh, 18th and 19th, I think I got those dates right. Middle of August. Yeah, we'll we'll put all the links on yeah. there too. So and then I have another one in Kingston, uh, New York, upstate New York. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be speaking at B and H, and then we're going to go up and do a weekend uh, workshop. Um, then in, I'll be in Italy. Uh, I think it's Spain. Uh, there's a whole you know Europe thing I'm doing in the, in the fall. And but I do is, a lot of teaching. Yeah. And a lot of lectures. And and the the reason why. Um, even back 20 years ago, when I was, uh, you know, in Denver and rubbing elbows with photographers, I was always one to say, "This is how I do it." Mm -hmm. Some of them say, "How do you do it?" Here's how I do it. 
Oh, I love that because not well, everybody's that back then, open-minded. Well, it was even worse. Uh -huh. And I used to really tease photographers that come in the lab, and we would the, the lab would put one of your images up if you were kind of a you know established photographer. And so I, I would say, hey, I really like that picture. How'd you do that? They go <laughs> silence. <laughs> they wouldn't get it. It's like. It's just, it was like, well, I use one light, but they wouldn't tell you what light. Yeah. And, and photographers are like that, very guarded. Yeah. And, and, and most of it's because they're insecure. Uh -huh. They're afraid you're going to steal something from them. Yeah. And I learned years ago that nobody can be me. Nobody mm -hmm. can steal what I do. Well, because they'd have to steal everything that you did, not That's just right. the photography, exactly. but the personality exactly. and everything. That's impossible. So, so I've always been open. I've always had open door in my studio, so to speak. Uh, yeah. It doesn't mean... You know, come at 2 a.m., <laughs> yeah, which happens. Don't come at 2 a.m. But, uh, um, but I've been open. And so I've, I've loved, I love to share. And so I've fallen into this whole teaching thing. I didn't mm -hmm. plan this. Mm -hmm. um, I got invited, I don't know, three years ago. I think it was a PPA event. And um, I was like, sure, I'd come talk. And then the floodgate just opened. Mm -hmm. And my blog, I think, you know, with Flickr, all those things just, I mean, if I was to script this, if I sat down and said, okay, I'm going to, I want to teach, I want to, you know, go all over the world, you know, teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't have scripted this. Mm -hmm. It's come together that amazingly. So I feel very blessed in that. Um, I think the, the reason why people resonate with my images, not everyone likes my images. In fact, go to any Flickr uh, on my Flickr site and look at, you know, there's people, <laughs> I love it, love it, love it, and then, ah, I don't like this look. This is crap. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, but um, um, it's because I think I've stuck with my guns yeah. at building a look that I love, mm -hmm. and I've refined it to the point where it's, you know, it's, I've been doing this a long time. So yeah. my skill level's there, I guess you'd say, and I, but I've stuck with my guns on one look, mm -hmm. and then people go, hey, Joel Grimes, look, well, you know, they remember that. Yeah. The best compliment anyone can give me is, I saw an image, and before I looked at the credit, I knew it was yours. Yeah. And whether you love it or hate it. Yeah. It's branding me. Yeah. And uh, so this whole teaching thing has been great. Um, I'm a little worn out now because this year I've had so many events. I just got back from Saudi Arabia and Dubai. And uh, it was a great experience um, teaching. But it was three workshops. In, in Saudi, it was three workshops and uh, one lecture. And then in, in Dubai, one lecture. And it was just like boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom. And I, usually I do like a, a weekend workshop. Mm -hmm. It takes me three days to recover. Yeah, oh, it's those are so intense. draining. They're intense. You do three workshops back to back, yeah. and a lecture. You know, almost it was like ten days straight. Uh, I'm still recouping. That was two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. So, um, but but I love getting the message out there. Yeah, and that's why I'm here. Yeah, is um, you know driving an hour and a half to get here uh, to be a part of this is to to get the message out that um, we're in a great age. This is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It really is. I mean, you think about it. Out of all the things you'd be doing, this is a lot of fun mm -hmm. to be able to create. And I have another thing that I love to share is that, um, you know, people say, well, you know, I'll, I'll ask someone, you know, they say I'm a photographer, I go, or are you an artist? Mm -hmm. and they'll say, um, well, they're a little he hesitant to say they're an artist, okay? To identify, I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. That's almost like a little snobby. It, it has a certain stigma yeah. to it right now. And, and so I ask, and they go, no, I'm not an artist. I'm just a photographer. <laughs> I go, well, okay, um, do you have a passion to create? They go, well, yeah. Well, then you're an artist. By definition, you're an artist. And I believe that as human beings, we all have a passion to create to some degree. Yeah. You know, and, and I have probably more than, say, the person who's an accountant. <laughs> you know, that was I my shouldn't, pastime. <laughs> I shouldn't say that because you, you can be very creative with numbers. <laughs> yeah, you can be. Not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> but the fact is, I think we all have that that part of us that says, you know, I want to do something, I want to hang on a wall. There's nothing greater than taking a print and put it on the wall. Yeah. Something you took the time to work and to, to develop and stand back and say, I did that. Yeah. And my brother, who's a fireman, brother Jim, he's getting photography now and he's having a blast. And uh, he'd gone on this trip and he did these pictures and we, I have his big printer. So when you have a big printer, by the way, you have a lot more friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everyone wants big prints. So I said, I'll, I'll make some prints for you. And he, he made, we made some big prints. And, and, and so we were going to get ready to frame him. And I said, oh, you got to sign it. And he was like, sign it? He was a little, little hesitant. But that's what an artist does. I go, well, you got to sign it. He's like, you know, kind of nervous. He's like, I go, get in there. Give that signature a good whack. And, and it's because 
he was like, well, you know, we're, we're kind of hesitant to, yeah. to call ourselves artists. You, you don't, you don't want to feel like, I think people are scared of feeling like they're being cocky or being, right. you know, something. But it's, it's very true. Every, we, we love it. We love it to stand back and say, I did that. And he's having a blast now creating images and, and uh, making prints and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's a great outlet, um, you know, to, to explore. And I think most of us um, probably haven't achieved what we really can mm -hmm. because we have these insecurities and these things holding us back. And so that's part of my message mm. is getting people to get out, create, having mm -hmm. a blast at it. And um, if you think about it, um, you know, I love music. And I love to sing and record a little bit. And GarageBand mm -hmm. is this amazing tool now. You can record, you know, yeah. multi-tracks. And so we're in a great age of that. People can, you know, in your little room, you can lay down a whole band, you know. Yeah. And with photography, it's the same way. We now have tools to go and do things we couldn't do before. Yeah. All at our fingertips right now. I don't have to worry about a lab. I don't have to worry about other people. And so I try to encourage people to get out and explore this this uh, amazing process uh, with a camera and, and the tools we have today. And, mm -hmm. and uh, to have fun at it. Well, I love that. And you're an amazing educator. We're going to put all your links up for everything. Whenever you have workshops or tours or anything, let us know because we'll announce to the community. And before we close, I want to take a couple, we'll take a couple of your guys' questions. And because uh, I know there were some specific questions on techniques and stuff that people had. Let's check it out. And I use, by the way, Joel's image that he doesn't like. <laughs> Taking, I look like a cartoon character. You do kind of look like well, a cartoon character. Well, it was a really character. wide lens, and, and, and they made a crack, and I just went, ah, laughed, and then, and then I hated the picture, and then now it's everywhere. It's the first one that showed up on Google, so I'm like, oh, I'll just use that one. Yeah. Okay, so I like this. Um, Morgan Risby asked, is there an effective way to use pop-up flash successfully for fill light without drowning out the entire frame? I'm not able to invest in a speed light at the moment, trying to be resourceful with what I have, which is great because we we're kind of talking about being resourceful. So with a pop-up flash though, I mean, do you have any suggestions? Because I can't really think of any way small to... Small modifier, right? Yeah, it's very small. Okay, that, that, that is, um, uh, you know, it's a good, it fills in the shadows. Yeah. Okay, so it's a great tool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're in a pinch, great. Uh, in fact, I was in Tanzania photographing for the Department of Labor. This is a really strange story, but um, I had all my lights, you know, and I was doing stuff. And it was a six-week program, uh, uh, five countries uh, project. And I was going along, and I was actually, it was, it was showing um, child labor. Mm -hmm. People, getting, parents that put their kids in child labor, and they were now successfully getting parents to have their own businesses, taking their children out of child labor. But one of the scenarios was a prostitute. Mm -hmm. And we went into this, I mean, really rough neighborhood. They said, you can't take anything but your... Just camera. camera and at, back then it was I had the it was the first digital camera I had was at uh, Fuji S2 mm -hmm. a little pop-up flash mm -hmm. and I literally popped that thing up in the in this I mean I'm not even I, I can't even get into all details of but it was really rough we had to go in with guards mm. and I had literally like four minutes to go into this room where this girl was where they do their transactions mm -hmm. and there was a candle and I had my camera and I just put it on my knee and I popped that flash up and I powered, underpowered it by four or five stops. So mm. it just went boop. Super light fill. So that candle lit her and I was like, click. And a little flash went off and it filled in and it looked beautiful. And yeah. they used it in, the, in, the, in their brochure thing or the, 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 the Department of Labor. But, but so there's times when you can take that little trick yeah. and use it, but it's a small modifier. Yeah. So it's right over the lens. So it kind of fills in like almost like a ring light mm -hmm. kind of thing. But, um, and you can overpower your settings to make it look just a little punch. Mm -hmm. But um, what I would do is, um, I, I would almost just say, raise your ISO, mm -hmm. shoot natural light. Mm. You know? And if you have to use it as a subtle, subtle fill light, because if you're using it as your main light, there's no way to not overpower everything in the scene. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough. All right, let's go on to another one. I have a, there's a good one in here about your HDR backgrounds. I like this one. It's from Amro uh, Ibrahim. He asks, basically, how do you create such clean HDR backgrounds without getting them so gritty and noisy? Well, HDR has gotten a bad rap mm -hmm. because um, 
a lot of people have taken it and made it look so grungy and so whacked out, tone map, what yeah. they call that. Super candied. And, yes. Yeah. yeah. And HDR, if you think about it, really has one main goal. That is, at least for me, that is to get detail in the highlights and detail in the shadows I couldn't get with one capture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you can get detail in the highlights and detail in the shadows that make it look so fake yeah. that you've gone too far. See, how I, right now, I can look outdoors and immediately... I see detail. Mm -hmm. I look over here underneath the couch, it's really dark, I see detail. So our eyes are really good at, at adjusting for super bright, super dark, mm -hmm. okay? A camera's not. Mm -hmm. One capture is gonna say, I have to make a decision. Pick a range. Pick a range. HDR allows me to take that range, blend it together, and make one capture that has detail in both. Mm -hmm. So if I was to shoot, like say, for example, right now, out the window, I could make it so that that, that sky is almost black. Mm -hmm. really really dark yeah is that real no no so my goal is <laughs> to live in hell <laughs> take take hdr to a point that gives me a greater tonal range mm -hmm. than one capture yeah but i don't want to overdo it to where it looks candied and unreal yeah. and surreal and same thing with the sliders yeah. so in in photomatics or in um nick software mm -hmm. I go in and I do a re almost, I don't hardly touch anything. I just mm -hmm. bring it in, let it do its thing. I maybe take the gamma a little bit, mm -hmm. the white point a little bit. I take that, what they call the light mode, whatever. And and if you push it to the left, you get really that gross look. If you push yeah. it to the right, it's more realistic. Yeah. I go all the way to right. Yeah. So my HDRs processed, and I also overexpose. I let the gamma up a little bit to where it looks a little overexposed. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look anything like what I'm going to end up with. For what, sure. What I end up with is now I take my Photoshop techniques with blending modes and going to color and black and white layers. I create that edgy look in Photoshop, not in mm. Photomatics or in Nick software. Yeah. Nick and, and both those have these presets and you can do all that really funked out stuff. I don't even touch that. Mm. So uh, the question would be is keep your, for me, my vision is to keep it as minimal of an impact. Very subtle. Yes. Yeah. And then, even when I go into Photoshop later and I'm creating these images, let's say I took a tunnel mm -hmm. and it was, uh, you know, I got detail all the way down the bottom of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will now take a layer with a white brush on 30% opacity, 30% flow, and blow, create a blown out, look behind mm. my subject. Yeah, yeah. So I just kind of got killed my whole HDR, right? Yeah, yeah. But I'm creating a mood and an atmosphere yeah. that looks more realistic to what we would see in real life. Does that yeah. make sense? No, I love that. I love that. And uh, and you're probably shooting everything, all your HDR background, you're shooting probably 100 ISO or as low as possible, right? Yeah. To make sure you're not adding additional yeah. grain. Yeah, in fact, Canon just recently told me mm -hmm. that the native ISO for their cameras is 160. Even in stills? I, I thought that yeah. was a video thing. Where well, this is what they told me. Wow. I was at, uh, at a workshop, and the, one of the guys came, was represented from Canada. Canada, he said, 160. I've always been at 100, right? Yeah. Not an icon stuff is at 200. Yeah. So we, when I go to a workshop, I set everything at 200 just so mm -hmm. everyone's happy. But um, um, today our cameras are getting so amazing. I yeah. have the, the 5D Mark III, yeah. the high ISOs. It's just amazing. So, um, you know, but I do... Just from history, I, I keep it as low as possible. Yeah. So. You know, one thing that we like to do too, and this might help out also, um, we've kind of, and I'm not comparing anything, but we've, in the wedding industry, we've become known for our HDR because we kind of brought it to the wedding industry. That's what our signature look has been. We do a similar thing where we'll, we'll process our, our file in Photomatix or NIK. Um, we do a kind of exaggerated HDR and we pull that into Photoshop with the original properly exposed shot. And then we blend back the HDR. Absolutely. So we're, we're doing the exact same thing. Absolutely. We're just toning the HDR like down to 20, 30%, painting back in skin tones from the original image, and yeah. then you keep it super subtle. Because I'm, I'm with you. The this HDR on the internet has got <laughs> such a bad rap because you think of HDR and you th everybody just like wants to, I threw it in my mouth a little bit a second ago. Yeah. So like, but that's not what HDR is. It's just like you said, we want to see detail on both sides, but realistic, right? So I like that. I like that a lot. Keep it subtle. Um, let's see here. <laughs> Jared Campbell. This is kind of a funny <coughs> one. 
due to your recent success, which I don't know if it's recent, he's been successful for a while, but will you lower the price on your video tutorials for like half of a week? <laughs> or, well, here's what I do. It, at any events that I go to, I give everyone a 50% discount. Oh, there you go. So even if it's at a $30, $30 entry or a free entry at you know some of these events, I, I let people, you know, I give them, I give them uh, discounts. But um, uh, and you know what? I felt really bad when I first did my first video that I put a price tag on because uh -huh. I was giving everything away. Yeah. And uh, when I started teaching, I had a couple uh, seasoned uh, instructors that said, "Joel, you got to get a product. Otherwise, yeah. you, you're, the speaking fees you make nothing. Yeah. Barely pay, uh, pay your travel. Mm -hmm. And so they said, if you don't have a product to sell." You will last maybe a year mm -hmm. in this in this teaching mm -hmm. thing. If you have a product, you might last two years <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you feel justified by spending you know ten days at somewhere, you know, and you make you know a small chunk of change. Yeah. And, and you're like, wait a minute, I could have done, you know, pet portraits yeah. at the Sears <laughs> and made more money than I just made. Seriously. So I, I feel bad, you know, uh, selling uh, something as a tutorial, but it is a must. For me no, to survive, totally. and and, and um, you know, there's bundles. I get these major bundle deals, you know, so you can buy all six for you know at, at basically almost half price. Yeah, you know. Well, we'll keep you guys informed if we ever see a discount or something that Joel gives. We'll announce it so you guys see. But but yeah, you have to. I mean, if you go into Barnes and Nobles or a bookstore, you buy these books, you buy the tutorials. I mean, this stuff that you're teaching is incredibly valuable because it teaches you what books don't necessarily. This teaches you real world stuff. Where I feel like books are oftentimes more theoretical, whereas if you're in this situation, if you're in this situation, do this, do this. Your stuff is more direct and to the point. This is what we're going to do in this scene, and, and they're very high-quality products, so they're worth it. All right, let's see here. I like this one. This will be the last question that we take, so let's do this. It's from Carrie Lodenbach. I hope I pronounced that right. Lodenbach, something like that. Um, Joel is known for his style of photography. As he looks out onto the horizon, how does he see his work evolving and changing? I love that because we talked about that a little bit. So without revealing too much, I mean, where do you see yourself kind of going in the next few years as far as your style evolving? Well, um, the number one thing I have to do as an artist mm -hmm. is to create images I love. Okay, so wherever that takes me, I'm going. So whatever you love in three years, that's, that's right. where you're going to be. Now, if what I love ends up nobody likes, <laughs> I may relook at that because I do have to make a living, right? Yeah. Okay. But really, it's what I like. Now, what I noticed in, 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 in doing this after 30 years that is that trends come and go. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like, for example, black and white. Mm -hmm. um, I, for a long time, I did, you know, like almost 10 years, I did black and white. Mm -hmm. I specialized in that Type 55 Polaroid. Mm -hmm. And then it, it took its course, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, all the splashy color came along, and now it's kind of a desaturated color. Mm -hmm. And who knows? Black and white is, I'm starting to get more, if you notice, I mean, more black and white images are showing up on yeah. my, my site. Yeah. Because it's going to come back to some degree. It's just the way it's It's all are. cyclical, cyclical it right? So, so um, maybe do a little more black and white. Um, I am trying to pick themes. Like, for example, I started this vintage swimwear Look, mm -hmm. you know, girls in vintage swimwear stuff. And so I'm trying to take, you know, a theme and then shoot it like 30 times or 100 times. Mm -hmm. And then you build 10 beautiful images. And mm -hmm. then people go, oh, wow, you know. So I'm pushing myself in that direction too is, is I did it with sports. Okay, I like that. I mm -hmm. still like the sports thing. But still taking ideas within sports and just say, okay, I'm going to do this and do it over and over and over again and become, mm -hmm. you know, um, what I call an expert in that arena because I've done it so many times. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, um, I don't really know what tomorrow brings. Though, I just posted some stuff on Flickr, uh, two images, uh, one on Facebook, um, that is pretty cool. I love it. Yeah. And it's a total different look. I mean, I say total different, different look. It's um, One's a farmer in Kansas. Uh-huh. Uh, farmer looking subject with a barn in the background, but I took this treatment and what you know how I discovered that I was going I, I got asked to be on a, a stock website mm -hmm. or a, you know a stock agency and I was like who you know who is this these people and I went over and I saw this they had historical images mm -hmm. and I thought, that's kind of cool I clicked on that and I found these about four or five images that were like taken you know 100 years ago mm -hmm. they had this really wild treatment to it 
Really? I don't know what it was, you know, back then. Yeah. And they had this really kind of warm yellow look. Mm -hmm. And I went, I like that. I'm going to see if I can duplicate that lookish feel. And I did that with that farmer, and I just shot it with this girl on, on a dock. That's way cool. Um, we'll have to show that image for sure when the article yeah. is up. So, you know, that was from a not current. It wasn't from a current photo mm -hmm. shooting photographer. It's from history. And that's another thing I say is that if you're a student of history, it's going to take you a lot further. Mm. Learning what we, what took place in the past yeah. is a huge benefit to where we are going to go in the future. Well, I love that. You're looking for inspiration from everywhere. History, mm -hmm. you're throwing things at the wall and you're seeing what sticks mm -hmm. and kind of moving forward. But it's I think it's impossible to say where you will be, but but you're constantly trying. And... Here's what's interesting. My wife does my Facebook for the uh -huh. most part. But she <laughs> said, let's put that up on Facebook. And um, when I went to Saudi Arabia, I had this one girl in a um, burqa. Mm -hmm. And it got a lot of attention, and um, and it so it, it exceeded all the images I'd put on Facebook at that time. Yeah. Okay. So it kind of went viral a little bit, and uh, so we thought well, that's pretty cool, you know. And then we just put this farmer thing up I think yesterday, and it's like five times what wow. the other one, and it just went went nuts. That's insane. And it's that look I got from that inspiration of that old photograph. Yeah. So derive inspiration from everywhere. Throw things to the wall, try it out, see what sticks, and go with it. Yep. I love Very it. So good. thank you so much, Joel, for coming in. This has been a wonderful interview, and I appreciate you taking out of time here. I know why you don't play football or watch football now, because I don't know where you'd find time to watch football <laughs> with all the teaching and yeah. shooting and everything. So really appreciate you taking time to stop Very by. Very good. All right, guys. We'll see you guys in the next episode.